Hello, and welcome to a video about Thor Love and Thunder. And flicker. But before I talk about the movie, I want to touch on how much I hate Disney Plus. The platform is dog shit. Whenever you watch anything on Disney Plus, pausing and rewinding is super annoying. If you want to rewatch a section, it's gonna take about two minutes to buffer to that section again. The streaming service is filled with bugs too. You know when you pause a show and the bottom of the screen will be grayed out so you can more easily see the timeline? Sometimes when you use Disney Plus, when you resume the show, the bottom of the screen will still be grayed out. And so you have to close out Disney Plus entirely reopen it just to get it to work properly. It's so bad. Simply put, Disney Plus does not have a good compression algorithm. So the files streaming on Disney Plus put a larger strain on your network by using up more bandwidth than a similar file on Netflix would. Because of this, Disney Plus will buffer more frequently and sometimes the quality of what you're watching will dip dramatically. If there's one thing good I can say about Netflix that I can't say about Disney Plus, it's that, hey, at least Netflix is usable. <laughs> Before watching this new Thor movie, I was expecting something terrible. Something like the Mulan 2020 remake, for example. And don't get me wrong, I like taking pot shots at the big evil mouse just like anybody else. And I was preparing myself for a shit show. After seeing the titles and thumbnails of all these other videos, Thor Love and Thunder is a bad joke. Thor Love and Thunder is a mess. Thor Love and Thunder, why Marvel villains keep flopping. Anatomy of a failure. The huge missed potential of Thor Love and Thunder. Thor Love and Thunder, it's hot garbage. Thor Love and Thunder, a fundamental writing flop. Why Thor Love and Thunder sucked. Thor Love and Thunder sucks. I have to say this, okay? And I'm guilty of this too. I think it's far too easy to be roped into the negative online maelstrom around certain media. And all it takes is for one big name to say a certain bad thing about a movie, other people will be influenced by that opinion and they will echo some of those sentiments. And the more people around the internet that say the same thing will result in the overall accepted opinion of that thing. Thing. This happened with the band Nickelback. Look at this crowd! And to a certain degree, it's happened to Thor Love and Thunder. Sometimes I think it's warranted, with abominations like Rise of Skywalker, and specific seasons of a show like the final season of Game of Thrones. Sometimes media can be so disappointing that the backlash online makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, you gotta be honest, those are awful. And sure, this can happen in the opposite direction as well. When a bunch of people start spewing false positivity about something, it might make it a little bit more awkward to say anything against that, because then you have a bunch of people dogpiling on you, because of that opinion. And that's not a great feeling. Huge props to Angry Joe for keeping his Suicide Squad review up after all of these years. I didn't agree with his opinion back then. That was an awesome fucking movie! Yeah, it was! It was but it's admirable keeping something like that up, especially when people love to shove that in his face years afterwards. I'm just saying, remaining faithful to your experience and telling people online about it when the internet at large disagrees with you can be very uncomfortable. It could even go so far that you might feel gaslighted. You start thinking about the movie like, hey, maybe I'm wrong about my opinion. And that's not to say that someone's opinion on a piece of media can't change upon subsequent watches, because of course it can. That being said, Thor Love and Thunder is fun. In my opinion. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that this is my opinion, seeing how it's my video on my channel and I'm the one saying it. But for some people out there, it seems like I have to say that because there's a whole lot of people out there that believe the most popular opinion online is the right opinion, which isn't always true. The movie has some fairly effective payoffs. It's sometimes funny, it's sometimes cringe, and sometimes the cringe is funny. There's a few moments throughout the movie where the villain is very haunting. The way they utilize lighting in some scenes makes him look extremely intimidating. That being said, the movie is far from great. It's just perfectly fine. Wow, this guy looks very stinky. If only he was using Dr. Squatch. Today's sponsor. Do you sweat a lot and do you stink just like me? <laughs> Well, looks like you need to use Dr. Squatch. Dr. Squatch is changing personal care with high performance natural products that smell amazing and will have you feeling and looking your best. They got incredible soaps, amazing shampoo and conditioner, deodorant, basically anything you need to smell and feel your best. And I'm a huge fan of their hilarious Sasquatch logo. There's bubbles coming out of his pipe. I don't know, he's smoking some weird stuff, but at least it's clean. Dr. Squatch's products are made using only the finest ingredients Mother Nature 
nature has to offer. They're transparent about their ingredients and their production. In fact, all of their products are at least 98% natural in origin. They never use any harsh chemicals or harmful ingredients, and all of their scents are naturally derived. Dr. Squatch has super convenient subscription plans with extra savings and free shipping so you never run out when you need it most. Just sign up, choose your goods and scents, and it shows up right at your door. If you use Dr. Squatch and you don't think that their products are the best you've ever had, they'll send you your money back guaranteed. That's just how confident they are in their very amazing smells. My favorite soap of theirs is Bay Rum. It's amazing. I highly recommend it. And their Cypress Coast shampoo is to die for. New customers will get 20% off on orders of $20 or more. Use my code DSQLVIS and click the link in the description below. Thank you so much to Dr. Squatch for sponsoring this video and keeping me smelling my best. Now back to the review. At times it felt like this movie was trying its hardest to be a James Gunn flick, but not really nailing it. But that doesn't mean it's terrible. It was written and directed by Taika Waititi. He's the guy behind What We Do in the Shadows and Jojo Rabbit, two pieces of media that I thoroughly enjoyed. Christian Bale plays the villain in this movie. He's a guy named Gore. In the comics, he looks like this, but they didn't want to make him noseless in this movie because then he would too closely resemble Voldemort. <laughs> And of course, you know, Voldemort being one of the most famous villains in history, I don't think it'd be wise to kind of mimic that look. And I like the way they made Gore look in this movie. What was that? Gore has a daughter in this movie, and she's the real life daughter of Chris Hemsworth. The first thing we see of Gore is his shadow, which foreshadows his ability to use the shadow realm with the Necro Sword later in the movie. When faced with the god that Gore worshipped, and finding out his true nature, the Necro Sword calls out to him and he uses it to kill the god, and this begins his path of villainy. When he claims the Necro Sword, he turns monochromatic, as he's now the controller of shadows, the absence of light, which works well in contrast to the rainbow looking Bifrost that the Asgardians use to travel. There's a rainbow trail behind a boat that Thor ends up using later in the movie. It's just an interesting way of showing all colors versus no color. Thor's meditative state in the beginning of the movie foreshadows the same meditative state that we see eternity in at the end of the movie. There are some pretty dumb moments in this movie. There's this alien race that he saves in the beginning, and they tell him about their temple that they cherish above all else. And then Thor just destroys it. <laughs> He just flies through it. He does end up defeating the enemy, which are like these weird bird creature guys. But yeah, not cool, dude. Jane explains to this guy that's sitting next to her how wormholes work, the same way they do it in Event Horizon and Interstellar. She does reference the movies. Interstellar? Uh, no. That movie explains everything really clearly. But it's still kind of lazy doing it this way. Jane has stage four cancer in this movie and it hasn't sunken in yet. So she's kind of in denial and she just started chemo. It's just kind of weird though, right? How has humanity not found a cure for cancer yet when this is the universe with the MCU in it? Like Tony Stark exists in this world and all these other geniuses. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense that cancer would still be plaguing the nation. Thor is gifted massive screaming goats. Giant goats! And I gotta say, it wasn't funny a thousand screams later. Thor's new outfit in the beginning of the movie is just terrible. I hate it. But thank God Stormbreaker is here to change his clothing, because that's exactly what happens. I think this is something that they can do. They can arm them with, like, Asgardian armor. It's just weird, though. A lot of the jokes don't land in this movie, and sometimes they're kind of painful. Sometimes they're references to other media, like when Thor is doing the split in between those two vehicles and they're pushing against him. But you have to sit there and wonder, why did he do that? Why didn't he just fly upwards and let them crash into each other? I guess it was very silly. Gore summons some shadow monsters to attack this little village. This place is empty, like nobody is out and about. But then a second later, it's filled with people. There's people everywhere. And then as Guardians and Thor come out of nowhere and start fighting, it's like early in the morning when Disney World just opens. Just a shit ton of people fill the streets in an instant. Jane shows up here. It's like the big reveal. She's supposed to be Mighty Thor now. They did show us her at the theme park approaching the shattered Mjolnir, but they never show us them becoming one. They did film this happening, but they decided later that it would be better if the reveal happened during this battle. I'm not sure if I agree with that. The shattered Mjolnir now acts as a sort of magical shotgun, and I think it's pretty cool. Later in the movie, Thor tells Mjolnir to keep Jane safe. Gore steals a bunch of children in this town. I don't think 
Gore has any plans on killing these children, he's just using them as bait because he needs Stormbreaker in order to gain access to eternity so he can make a wish. Gore has an ability to disappear and appear at will, but I guess it has to be super dark because he uses the shadows. It makes the fight scenes a little awkward, but it's still a fun ability to watch him use. He does something cool against Valkyrie later in the movie. Thor is kind of an irresponsible doofus in the beginning of this movie. He loves making speeches, but nobody cares. Stormbreaker is disobeying him. It's lashing out like a child because he's jealous of Mjolnir choosing Jane. I have to admit, I'm kind of a fan of the subtext of Thor finding out his ex-girlfriend is now in a relationship with his old partner Mjolnir. And then the jealousy of Stormbreaker, who as a part of Groot's race, is at least part partially sentient. Taika had said that the Stormbreaker's insecure behavior was because it was made of Groot's hand, and so the arm is also an adolescent, and is going through mood swings. It's kind of silly, kind of dumb, but also kind of funny. And then Axel, Heimdall's son, uses his ability to call out to Thor. And so we get a vision of him. He like pops up in the middle of a room, and it looks terrible. And they tried to fix it, and the new version also looks terrible. It turns out these kids are in the Shadow Realm. They're like floating on an asteroid in this little prison. The Shadow Realm looks suspiciously like space. And then there's Valkyrie's portable speaker hand grenade joke. No, it's a portable speaker. I have to admit, most of the jokes that landed for me ended with me going, that's so dumb afterwards, you know? Like it would make me laugh in the moment and then I would say, wow, that was stupid. <laughs> but it still made me laugh. So I'm kind of conflicted, you know? And then the heroes meet Bao, the god of dumplings. Come on, they are begging for me to love this movie. They meet Zeus and he has a Greek accent. I hear my open. But it almost sounds more Russian than Greek. He's played by Russell Crowe. He didn't do an amazing job. He was just fine. Like mostly everything in this movie. Thor asks Zeus for help against Gore. So Zeus removes Thor's clothing. And I guess his dick is so big that it made all the women faint. It feels like a joke that someone would make in a movie from like the early 2000s. <laughs> He's got a big dick, dude. Zeus puts these golden shackles on Thor, but they do fuck all. Thor just like rips them off. <laughs> Then there's a pretty neat fight scene between Thor and all these gods. But then he kills Zeus very easily by throwing his own lightning bolt through him. Like, come on, dude. The only thing you're supposed to be good at is catching the lightning bolt. And you couldn't do that? <laughs> Korg's face survival thing was kind of cute. I liked it. Korg's death choreographically mirrored Bucky's death in Infinity War, which is what triggered Thor into his rage. I thought that was a really cool poetic moment. I would have liked it if there was dialogue about how Zeus is washed up. He isn't the man he wants was he only cares about sex and food now or something like that he talks about orgies a lot that's like the only thing they talk about when he's there he's like hey you're not coming to my orgy gold being used as the god's blood i thought was pretty cool it was a great way to show the carnage while also keeping the rating where it needed to be it's also a reference to ikor which is gold god blood from greek mythology i found it kind of strange that there's a bunch of gods sitting in the stands and they just watch zeus get murdered and they don't lift a finger to help him it's very odd there's a scene when Thor gets his nose tickled by Valkyrie when he's talking to the kids in the Shadow Realm. <sighs> I don't know why I thought it was so stupid, but it got a laugh out of me, man. I don't, I don't know what to say. Dumb shit gets a laugh out of me more often than it should. <laughs> Gore needed way more screen time in this movie. Although I hate his Jokerish voice in some parts, it seems as though they weren't completely sure what voice they should work with. So they just tried this Joker style voice mixed in with a bunch of whispering. I think the voice of the character could have used more direction, but his look was awesome. Thor can't help but butt in with Doug jokes, even during very serious scenes, which I found kind of annoying at times. This movie tries to be funny way more often than it should. That being said, it did make me laugh quite a lot. So, hey. Gore ends up capturing Jane and Thor, and then this movie does something very surprising. It makes one of the characters competent during a very stressful situation, which I think is a pretty rare occurrence. Basically, Jane was able to deduce Stormbreaker's importance to Gore's plot and acts very quickly, so Gore couldn't very easily get his hands on Stormbreaker which leads Gore into asking Thor to call the axe. I mean, he could just have one of his monster guys go and fetch it for him. Then again, it was thrown into space, so it's probably like a billion miles away by now, so maybe that's not plausible. So Thor does summon Stormbreaker. Gore says something along the lines of, choose love, call the axe, which parallels the movie in a lot of ways because he does call Axel, kind of like calling the axe, and he does end up choosing love, which is what Gore ends up doing. I guess Gore didn't expect Stormbreaker to be able to 
free them. Maybe he underestimated the power it would give Thor. Either way, when Thor gets Stormbreaker, there's a massive explosion and it frees them. I like how it's basically all in black and white because they're in the Shadow Realm, but their weapons produce color. It's pretty neat. Valkyrie is using Zeus's Thunderbolt. I think she's outclassed by Gore because when she's fighting him, he's able to go into the shadows and pop back out. He grabs the Thunderbolt from her and kills her with it. When I first saw this, I was like, wow, that was pretty sad. But then I thought about it for a little bit and they are in his realm, right? It's kind of like in Dragon Ball Z when the heroes travel to a specific world, but there's rules to that world, whether it be like the gravity or whatever. And so they're outperformed by someone who is way more adept in that environment, which obviously Gore is in this scene. They tried to beam away with Stormbreaker, but Gore ends up getting his hands on it before they leave. Jane is separated from Mjolnir for a second, and so the cancer is catching up with her. She's dying. So Thor puts her in a hospital, and he's like, you get better. I'm going to deal with this myself. Don't worry. It'll be fine. And so he zooms away with Zeus's Thunderbolt. He finds where Gore is located. I'm not entirely sure how he was able to do this. Maybe because he has Stormbreaker, and Stormbreaker is like connected with Thor, so Thor just followed it. Who knows? Maybe Axel called to him because he has that ability and Axel just told him where they were. So Thor arrives to stop Gore. I hate how similar their names sound. I have to keep stopping myself like, stop saying Thor when you mean Gore. <laughs> Is it Thor or Gore? I don't know. Thor arrives on scene and he speaks to the kids instead of immediately trying to stop Gore, which was a weird decision, but whatever, it's cute, okay? It was a cute scene. He arms the children to fight with the Thunderbolt. He like gifts them with temporary Zeus powers, I guess. And so they all start fighting like the shadow monsters it's incredibly unrealistic, but it is a Marvel movie, so <laughs> whatever. You can give these children as much power as you want, but it doesn't mean that they'll be able to use them effectively at all. But whatever. It was cute. I like when that one kid had a stuffed animal and it had like eye beams. It was a callback to the boys, you know, from that one scene. A bunch of these kids are the children of the actors. They're Taika Waititi's kids, Natalie Portman's, Chris Hemworth's, and Christian Bale's. I think it's nice and cute how throughout the movie, Thor had been trying and failing to give a hero's speech. But at the very end, he tries one last time with a bunch of children, a group of people that need it the most, and it finally makes an impact, changing the mindset of all these scared children. And it's kind of believable because earlier in the movie, Axel was telling the kids about how they'll be saved by Thor. So when they finally meet Thor face to face at the end of the movie, it's much more believable that their fear would be replaced with hope. I think that tree pattern that's created when Thor empowers the kids with the Thunderbolt is supposed to be the tree of life from Norse mythology, I mean, it kind of looks like a tree, right? Jane can kind of sense that Thor is losing. Either that, or she just doesn't want to sit around and let herself die for no reason. So she uses the last bit of life in her to help Thor and the children. She arms herself with Mjolnir and pops out of nowhere to assist. How did Jane know where to go? Maybe because Mjolnir had a connection to Thor. That makes the most sense to me. Is the Pegasus she's riding capable of teleporting? How does she teleport? whatever. And then there's a scene when Gore casually carries Stormbreaker. How is he able to carry this thing? Is he basically like God status because of the sword and the Shadow Realm? Like he shouldn't be able to carry it, right? What? I gotta say Jane Foster's Mighty Thor speech at the end of the movie. Cringe. Yes. It hurts me to say this. It was cringe. I wish it wasn't because this is supposed to be like a powerful moment, right? But... <laughs> It didn't work for me. It felt like a very forced girl boss moment, and I just wish that it came across a little bit more natural. Jane uses Mjolnir's like shotgun ability to capture parts of the sword after it breaks, and I thought that was pretty sweet. Gore is able to open the pathway to eternity, and all is lost. Just kidding. Thor enters as well, and he uses Gore's conflicting thoughts against him. I guess this is the center of the universe. It's just like a bunch of clouds and some water. Why are there clouds in the center of the universe? Who who knows? But Eternity looks awesome. It's very reminiscent of the comic book version of the same character. Jane is lying there dying, and she whispers something to Thor, but we don't get to hear it. But it's pretty clear that she whispered, it's Thorbin time. It's Morbin time. I hate myself. Instead of trying to stop Gore, Thor decides to spend Jane's last remaining moments with her. This act, on top of the fact that Thor decided to help the kids earlier, shows Gore that his preconceived notions of all gods was false. Seeing this, Gore 
Gore decides to choose the life of his daughter over killing the gods. Some people call this moment cheesy, how it might be a little bit derivative, you know? Choose love, dude, you know you wanna do it. That's what you're missing, man. You're missing love. Love's the answer, man. But I still thought it was cute. Thor promises Gore to protect his resurrected child. And then there's a narration at the end of the movie. This part with his friend named Dwayne absolutely killed me. With a dude I met called Dwayne. <laughs> It's so stupid. Get it, guys? Dwayne the Rock. <laughs> Thor ends up raising Gore's kid. He gives her Stormbreaker, and watching her run with it at the end of the movie was kind of goofy. But then again, she is partially Eternity, so she's a god. She can wield it. It was still kind of silly. At the end of the movie, we find out that Zeus survived, and he wants revenge, and he tells this to Hercules. And then there's a scene when Jane Foster enters Valhalla. Earlier in the movie, we meet Sif, and she's missing an arm, and there's a joke about her arm being in Valhalla. Hey, maybe you arm is in Valhalla. It would have been really funny if at the end of the movie, when Jane enters Valhalla, there's an arm sitting there, but I guess they didn't think of this. There was an overabundance of licensed music in this movie, which made it feel like a desperate attempt to be another James Gunn movie, but without James Gunn's writing, which is where his movies really shine. There's a lot of charm and wit in them. Some of the songs did fit though, like Guns of Roses' Sweet Child of Mine, for obvious reasons. At the end of this movie, Thor learns that sometimes to win, you have to use compassion and heart instead of brute force. And Jane's character was used as a way for him to learn this lesson. But we also learn that Jane will do anything in her power to protect the one she loves. These character traits are reflected in Gore's character because he's just someone that lost his way. He let vengeance take control. But Thor and Jane reminded him why he went down this path in the first place. Because when he watches Thor and Jane at the end of the movie, it mirrors the loss that he felt in the beginning of the movie when his daughter was dying in the desert. It gave him something to relate to. It is weird that Thor's adopted daughter, Eternity's creation, the god of compassion named Love, is very quick to anger at the end of the movie, but she's still a child, so it's not a huge deal. Something that I noticed that I kind of liked was when Axel used Stormbreaker to activate the Bifrost, he hit the ground and turned it 90 degrees, imitating his dad and the Bifrost's key sword. I know I said this already, but I really wish there were more scenes of gore causing havoc. There should have been more scenes of him killing gods, making him out to be more of a threat. Apparently there were more scenes of gore filmed, and of According to Christian Bale, they were with Peter Dinklage and Jeff Goldblum, suggesting that he may have killed their characters in the movie. But for unknown reasons, they were removed. I was kind of disappointed with Zeus's Thunderbolt. I was expecting it to have some cool abilities. I mean, yeah, he was able to gift powers to the kids, but for the most part, it acted like just a pointy Mjolnir, which is pretty lazy, I think. I think it's so cool that Gore's whole reasoning for becoming a god butcher is that a god failed to protect his daughter, and therefore he believed that gods cannot be trusted to protect. But at the end of the film, he trusts a god, Thor, to protect his daughter. And the irony that at the end of the movie, his daughter, the person he loves the most, became the very thing he wanted to destroy. I really love the detail of Gore's scars. Clearly they were self-inflicted as a denouncing of the tattoos that must have honored his forsaken god. A scene of him doing this to himself would have been awesome, but we didn't get that, sadly. I love how the movie started with Gore in the desert while his daughter is dying, and the movie ends with Gore surrounded by water, but this time his daughter is revived and he is dying, which was a nice touch. This movie is chock full of references to other media, and while references alone don't make a good movie, it's still fun to pick up on them. It could be argued that Taika Waititi focused too heavily on references, and I think that might have lessened the overall quality of the writing in the movie, but overall that wasn't a huge deal. The movie's plot was a bit predictable at points, but predictability is not always a bad thing. If a movie is too predictable, it can get boring, but if it's slightly predictable, then I think it's completely fine. Predictability is not always a sign of low quality. With enough information, a viewer can sometimes make accurate predictions, which is not a fault of the storyteller. I would almost argue that directors that are desperately trying to subvert expectations are doing much more harm to their writing than predictability ever could. So yeah, guys, those are my thoughts on Thor Love and Thunder. I thought it was a perfectly fine 6 out of 10 movie, and I think there are a lot of movies out there like that. I'm not gonna lie, I enjoyed myself watching this. Did it make me cry from laughing? No. Did it make me cry because it's emotional? No. But did it make me laugh? Yes. I thought this movie was very pretty at times. The worst thing about this movie was the stuff that we didn't get to see. That and Zeus was kind of stupid. 
whatever. That's my review. I can't wait to go through the comments and read about how wrong I am about all this stuff. Let me know what you thought of this movie in the comment section down below. If you like cool clothes, head on over to AlienClothing.com. A-Y-Y-L-I-E-N Clothing.com. This shirt is over there. I think it's pretty cool. Alien is my personal clothing brand and we just came out with a bunch of new stuff and I think you would like them a lot. So go over there and check them out. Thank you so much to all my patrons that make videos like this possible. I love you. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.